So my name's Tony Watkin. I'm your facilitator for this evening. And it's important that I say I'm, I'm an independent facilitator. I work in the NHS. Uh, I do this uh, as part of my job in the NHS, uh, working with patients and members of the public about developments in healthcare. And I was invited to take part in this, uh, this uh, event tonight to just to bring that kind of um, independence, that impartiality to the conversation. So just to reassure everybody, I'm not affiliated to any of the uh, parties that are here tonight. Uh, and whilst I have an interest in what goes on, because I've lived in Knoll for, <gasps> gosh, 30 or so years, uh, I'm not a member of any of the community organisations that I know are represented here tonight. So my job is really to host the event and to try and facilitate this conversation. Okay, so that's me. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so let me introduce our panellists. I'm thrilled you've come tonight. I mean, there must be many other things you could be doing on a, on a Wednesday evening in early April. But um, we're joined by representatives from four of the parties. Uh, we have Anna Fry and Zach Barker from the Liberal Democrats who are here. We have Cam Hayward, Toby Wells from Bristol Green Party here. Uh, we have Christopher Orlick from the... Labour Party, and Gary Hopkins from the Null Community Party. And as we all know, Gary's our, uh, one of our current um, councillors for Null. And we also know that Chris Davis um, is a councillor too. And Chris isn't here tonight. But I, do, I think it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the work that Chris has put in over at least a couple of decades into Null Ward as a councillor and just to acknowledge some of the work he's doing. He's standing down at this election. So, Chris, you're not here, but, but thank you for that. <coughs> Takes a great personal commitment, I think, to being a councillor. It's not something I personally do myself, uh, but I, I take my hat off to, to all of you <laughs> who want to, get, to sort of move into that space. And, and for those of you who've done it uh, for a number of years, um, yeah, gosh, hats off to you. Okay, so I, I talked a little bit about the questions, um, and we've been collating questions. There are a couple of opportunities tonight also to, to bring in some new questions uh, into, into the debate. So we, the themes we're going to cover tonight are going to be broadly around uh, representation, around planning, and particularly uh, the, some issues around the uh, proposed Broad Walk Red Cats Quarter development. Um, we're also going to be talking about knife crime, and I'll introduce a little later to Carly, um, who's going to talk a little bit about a petition that she's organised as well. And there are some general questions uh, into the mix as well. What you have on your chairs, you have three things on your chairs. You have a, a blue poster that talks a little bit about the petition Carly's organising. You have a form that is asking you for any questions. Uh, as we go through the conversation, um, questions come to your mind. If you want to, write your question down on a bit of paper, and then we'll collect them at the break. We'll have a break at around about 8 o'clock, 10 minutes or so, and in the second half, we'll choose some of those questions to bring forward to the panel. So that what we're doing is we're not only talking about the questions that I've kind of put together from the ones that you've already received, but we'll take questions on the floor as well. And the other thing that you have on your chair is a feedback form. And if you do have uh, a moment, either at the, the end of the event, if you close the event, just stay back a bit, fill in the feedback form. Really useful information to get in, in that feedback form. Uh, uh, if you can't do it tonight, there is a web link that you can access, and you can do it online when you get home uh, or in the morning. And there are pens at the back of the room. One of our organizers has got a little stand in the corner on my right at the back, uh, and there are some pens there. Okay. So, one of the great things about this event, I, I will stop talking in a minute, is like any political event, um, the, it's a diversity of views. We've got, we've got four different parties here tonight. We've got, I don't know, 60 people in the room. We'll all have different views, different ways of thinking about common issues, issues that we're all 
interested in, issues that we all want to move forward. But we may have a slightly different way of expressing ourselves, a slightly different take on what the solutions might be. And all I'd ask tonight is that we just respect that, because that is the beauty of a democracy, that we are able to express our views and be respected when we do so. So that's, that's all I ask of you tonight. Okay. Everybody happy with that? Final things. There are no emergency um, alerts tonight. So if the bells go off, it's the real thing. Uh, and our volunteer organisers will escort us all out safely into the waiting areas outside. Uh, and there's one other thing. Oh, the toilets. Yes, of course, important. Toilets just out the door on the left. There they are. Don't stand on ceremony. If you need to go and go to the toilet, please do so. Don't wait for the break. Thank you. <coughs> right, OK. <laughs> There's a little bit of a lead-in for me. Um, I wanted to start off early with, I think, a question that is, is framed in, in the tragic deaths of uh, Max and Mason uh, in January, uh, just around the corner from here. And a dreadful tragic event and I, you know simply can't grasp the the enormity of that for for the families and, and, and relatives and since I think early last year there have been a number of knife crime issues in and around Bristol and a number of people wrote in onto the uh, email uh, website with questions around knife crime and we have a question here for the panelists which is, given the recent tragic events involving knife crime in Knoll and the deaths of Mason Rist and Max Dixon, what measures will you take to deal with knife crime and make Knoll a safe place, especially for young people? And I wondered, Gary, if you might like to start with that. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, sure. Firstly, some while ago, before the awful events, uh, we'd formed a local partnership down in Newquay Road uh, to actually tackle some of the problems of the area, residents, and we eventually managed to get some council representatives along to assist. And one of the aims was to actually reduce knife crime. And it was you know, tragic then what happened afterwards. We had a community clean-up the other day, uh, which involved a huge number of people. And what was interesting was that... Uh, you know, we cleaned the place up, but at the same time, three knives were found stashed where people were desperately surprised to see them stashed. Other weapons were left around, and those were picked up in the, in the clean-up. The, I think what should be said with regard to that crime was that the people involved do not, are not local uh, to know and the police have stressed that they do not think there's anything connected with any crime with the youngsters. We don't have a detailed explanation yet. Uh, it could be anything from misidentity through to some silly dispute getting completely out of hand and being, uh, you know, going on to uh, a stabbing, quite awful. Also, the difference between uh, the knife uh, wielding in South Bristol and what happened in the East. Bristol is very different. There we've got gangs involved. Uh, here we do not have gangs involved and the police have stressed that. So it's not great but it's not as bad as it is in some parts of Bristol. Um, I think that the partnership that we've pulled together, the police have been very cooperative. I've got to say some years in the past the police were a bit like an occupying force in the west of Norm. Uh, they're not now. They do take it on board local feelings and it's important that any initiative doesn't come down from the top. It's coming from the people actually on the ground. And residents have been involved in that group. We've now managed to get some changes, some CCTV put in. We've managed to put some safety measures in. But the crucial part that's needed, and we're halfway through getting it now, is the reclamation of a youth club that was taken away from the community and was actually handed to for a, a church from abroad who have no connection with the community at all and that has caused massive problems We're, we've been pressing the mayor myself and residents uh, pressing questions to the mayor about 
uh, getting that that uh, uh, youth club back. We've got volunteers to run it. We've got funding. We've now got the school, local primary school involved, because <laughs> it's not once pe people start welding knives, it's a bit late. So education courses will be happening through our partnership with the local primary schools because sometimes the older children use the younger ones because they're under the age of criminal responsibility. So getting the, the, the in young with, with the schools is important. They're now a full part of the partnership. That's brilliant. Thanks, Gary. Could I bring the um, Anna and, and Zach in and then we'll come to, to Toby, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Great. Thank you. Hi there. Um, so I don't think there's anyone in the room or indeed in the city that hasn't been touched by what happened to Max and Mason. It's absolutely abhorrent. Um, I work in this community. In fact, I work here at the Park Centre. It's a community that I feel very embedded in. And yeah, it, it's just horrific. And I don't want to dwell too much on the, the the circumstances surrounding that. As Councillor Hopkins said, we don't really have the full details and I don't think that that really is what we're sort of here to discuss tonight. Um, what I would say is that I really commend the Newquay Road partnership and partnership working uh, is really vital. And as, as Gary said, actually, working with people from the bottom up, from the ground up, is the way that we get things done. Um, and, and yeah, that has to continue. So if we were, if we had the pleasure of being elected, that is something that I would really be keen to continue. Um, it involves working with young people as well and engaging young people at a very young age. Um, you know, secondary school is too late. So working again at a primary level um, to address the causes of knife crime. You know, we can't just stick a slipping a, a, a plaster on it. Um, that's not going to solve the problem um like i say it's a complex difficult issue isn't it and it's multifactorial and i think the the key thing for me would be to work with people from across the community and ask what they think will help i don't think it's my position necessarily to come along and say as a counselor you know that this is this is what we need to do. I think people know what needs to be done and our job as councillors would be to facilitate that and to support that um, in terms of legislation and, and anything that can be done from City Hall and out in the community. Um, Thanks, Anna. Toby and Cam, so there's something about partnerships, there's something about working with young people, working with residents to, to find solutions, there's something about youth centres, uh, there's something about the police as well. What else would you add to that? Yeah, so I, I won't reiterate some of the, the, the good points that have been made, um, but I think you really have to split this into the, the short-term measures, which are really kind of um, reactive um, and, and trying to solve an immediate problem, which is that there are, there are knives out there, there are people using knives and committing crimes. So some of the communi community initiatives, like the Bleed Kits initiative, are absolutely fantastic, um, absolutely brilliant. Really support um, Carly, who's been leading that campaign. I, th I think it's fantastic. But it is a, a, a sticking plaster for an issue that shouldn't exist in the first place. So for me, our priority is really pushing to understand the root cause of these systemic issues. So. In, in the industry that I work in, in, in my day job, um, whenever an incident happens that leads to, to harm or, or death of a person, we, we do a very thorough um, root cause analysis. We keep asking the question why and why and why again until we get to the actual root cause. And this isn't about blame, so the police obviously should uh, follow up on the crime and prosecute those responsible, and that's the blame part done. But after that, it's why did why did those people who committed this crime why were they in that position in the first place and what can be done is it education is it youth centers is it something else to actually stop this kind of thing from happening in the first place thanks thanks, thanks toby before we hear from uh, chris i'd like to introduce you to carly olden uh i beg your pardon <laughs> beg your pardon i've been giving duff information folks uh congratulations um and Carly, you're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the bleed kit training that you're promoting. Um, and um, Sean, could we have the, the roaming mic for Carly? Thank you. 
Um, hello. Um, so I'm Carly, um, and myself, along with Partner FC, have put together this petition as um, one of the boys that got killed in January was a player of our club, um, Max, so it's obviously affected the club an awful lot. Um, so we've put this petition together to get bleed kit training into secondary schools from year seven up, um, not just the training, but the education around it. Um, so really, my questions tonight was really, how, how are you all willing to support me and the club in getting that help and get it into the schools. And one thing I will say, back to Gary as well, um, there is definitely gangs over this side of town. There is definitely post-code wars over this side of town. It is not just over there. It is here as well. And one youth centre in Newquay Road isn't going to stop knife crime. Thanks, Carly. Beautifully and succinctly put. And I think plays into the comments that were coming from Anna around the importance of working with local residents to find solutions. And what you've talked about is a specific measure that you're leading to change things. So congratulations and thank you for that. <laughs> Chris, can I come to you? And the question, of course, is around where you'll be successful as a councillor for the Null Ward. What specific measures would you take to address life crime? Um... Well, there's various things. I mean, lots of things have been said already. Uh, the, the, I would like trading standards to cut down, stop shops selling knives, which is daft in a sense, because everyone's got knives at home, but that would be a start. They, they brought the status symbols, these knives. Nationally, of course, it would have a national government to do something about people buying knives on, online, using the internet. Um, the, 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 the young people said, well, what we need more, more services for young people, youth work, I mean, people can, champions like Ellis Gange, who's doing work with uh, kids in Knoll, with a, a rugby player. Community champions who can help them, that sort of stuff. Uh, and more youth work. I mean, there's, there's, there's very little youth work. We are, council is doing something in, in Inns Court, coming on stream in a couple of years' time. But the main thing is education and uh, using it, as somebody said, starting at schools, but also having um, young people's champions who can talk to them about their experience and why it's not a good idea to carry knives. Thanks, Chris. Sounds like it's a long game yes. involving lots of different people, lots of agencies, and, and the, the commitment and energy of local residents and community groups. And Sandra, roaming mic person, um, I'm going to open up to the audience. Now, if you'd like to, to make a comment or ask a question, just put your hand up, and we'll do our best to, to get around some of you. I can't guarantee we'll get around to everybody. But uh, is that OK? So, uh, Sandra, we have a, a question or a comment here. Yeah, I agree with the point about um, the importance of youth work and preventative services. And I'm just interested as to what you think you would be able to do to promote that as councillors, given the cuts we know have happened to youth services and the lack of funding. Thanks. One of the problems is that I, when, when I took over in charge of environment before we had a mayor a long time ago, we found out that there was some couple of wonderful new play facilities going in, but all the little ones have been closed because they weren't available. And the same thing exactly happened with youth service. There's a big facility planned down at Inns Court that will have all sorts of facilities. But to pay for that, the basic youth service has been thinned out desperately. And actually, sometimes you don't need a huge amount of money. You need commitment. And local people with the right commitment to youth work can make a difference. We had a, a wonderful youth worker who was a volunteer in the old uh, Dave Werrett, who made a great, great strides. And people still remember him now because of the work that he actually did. So it's not fancy buildings. It's not huge amounts of cash. It's commitment to doing it locally and listening to local people. Thanks, Gary. Chris? Um, I think what you're going to hear from all of us tonight, it could be called aspirational. We, we know what we're going to do, and it's, it's all aspirational. Uh, in terms of the youth work, uh, I 
think voluntary, like Skemmer's Boxing Club down in Jubilee Hall is a, a good example of where Closing. voluntary... Sorry? Closing, Is it? Oh, right. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Um, but uh, I would... Uh, politics about choice, isn't it? Do you spend money on youth work or filling up potholes in the road? Uh, that, so we all want to do the right things, but it's a question of how you do it. But I suppose what we're trying to give a flavour is, is what, what our priorities are. Which is difficult. I mean, do you fill in potholes or do you look after kids in care? I don't know. So it's aspirational, what I'm saying. I think I think it like there is there's definitely issues with cuts and how that it, there isn't the funding in from the council to be able to provide the as much use of services as we want. Um, but when there's a will, there's a way. I think, and as Guy says, there's there's that there's the Eagle House Youth Centre which got closed down. The council could take control of that again and reopen it. And if there's people in the community who are willing to um, help fund that, then it's possible. I think, um, and I think we have seen there there is a lot of will in the community to to put put their time into these things. So. It just needs the willpower from those in those in power to actually think about those changes. I think. Thanks, Cam. Zach, do you want to add anything to that? Partner? Yeah, please, of course. So, yeah, I suppose to echo um, what Chris said. You know, I think we're all aware that there's finite money and it's ever finite and it's reducing all the time and without sort of wanting to cast blame elsewhere or go too much into that, funding from, from national government to local government is depleted. But I think we have to really think about our priorities here. And as, as we've said, you know, it is difficult for, um, to sort of think about spending. And you know, what's, what's important to one person is less important to the next, and everybody, everybody is their own, is a priority. Um, but if we're talking sensibly here as well, by investing in youth services and actually spending money there, um, we solve problems further down the line that are a lot more costly in terms of criminal justice, health, uh, and uh, all of the other sort of larger issues. If we can nip those in the bud with good, strong youth services, and yes, that involves utilizing a, a community um, and services and voluntary services and galvanizing people to become involved in supporting younger people. That's really important. But it, it requires investment as well. And I do think that that's a priority um, across in this ward, but across Bristol as well, in the, in the light of current events, but other things as well that have, that have led to that. You know, what happened to Max and Mason, um, unfortunately, is just not an isolated incident. Um, it's a symptom, isn't it? And I think investing in youth services and supporting youth workers as well. And I'm, a, I'm quite a believer in the removal of red tape. So I work, um, again, in the health service. And um, we have lots of people that want to volunteer and come in and do voluntary roles and use their, their own experience and their skills to support people in a voluntary capacity. And I think that's something that we need to explore further within the council as well and enabling people to do that without having to jump through multiple hoops obviously ensuring that children and young people are safeguarded within that but you know encouraging people to come in and, and work thanks thanks anna carly can i come back to you there you are you're out there doing your thing something practical getting people to sign a petition raising awareness what are you hearing and what would you like to say to the prospective councillors um i don't know really it's a pretty there's never really a straight answer back in how you're going to do it, how you're going to help. Mm. You kind of blase over everything. Like, what we need to know is how are you going to help? How are you going to help us get this into the curriculum? We need 100,000 signatures to get it debated in Parliament. Mm. 100,000 signatures. How, how, how are we supposed to get that? Yeah, you might have signed it. You're one person. We need a hundred thousand. I know. Just saying. Well, Carly, um, we we can do something at a more local level. Um, so I think your initiative is fantastic to to raise the issue at national level. And as you say, that's really really difficult. 
but why don't we in Bristol be the trailblazers? Yeah. Why, don't we, why don't we support this locally, show how it can be done? We build that curriculum here in Bristol and then we use that as a case study for the rest of the country. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. I just, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, my, my partner actually works at the City of Bristol College and she was telling me earlier that they only have one bleed kit across their, I think it's four or five campuses with thousands and thousands of students. Yeah, um, but there's only one bleed kit. And I think that, that's, that's, t that's t um, t people in their teenage years and young adults at the City of Bristol College and the, the incidents could happen there or in those areas and I feel like places like City of Bristol College and other colleges should have those facilities available for them and as you say um, as part of their curriculum as well they should yeah, have the training how right to having use the it kits, but they've got to know how to use the yep, kit absolutely yep. you've got to know what you're doing with the kit so the training that be put into schools are going to show them how to use the kit. You've done the training. You've done it. I've done the training. Yep. We're in the process of putting it out in the community, free for other people to do the training. But we need to get to these kids while they're in school, not once they leave school and they're already in these gangs. And we need to get them before that, when they first go up at age 12, get it in them then. Mm -hmm. Because if they're learning what a knife can do, it surely would make them think twice about using something if they know exactly what it's going to cause if they've been learning how to deal with it. Thanks, Carly. And just a reminder, on your chairs, you'd have information about the petition. Uh, do consider uh, signing that petition. Are there any more questions? on this? And, and share it. Sign and share. Sign and share that petition. Okay. Um, I'm going to come over to Mike. Is that right? I mean, money is crucial and we need to elect priorities. The old committee system didn't seem to work, which is why they voted in the mayor. That system's now not worked. We're going back to a committee system, so how are you going to make this work when parties are not working together? There may not be a majority party. Thanks, Mike. And I think this issue will come up again later, but do feel free to, to comment on that now. Well, there's been some pretty unedifying sights in the council chamber over the last couple of months, I've got to say, which haven't been desperately helpful. Uh, squabbles between parties which haven't been helpful at all. Having said that, I think that there will be, once it's settled down, and there's bound to be disruption when we move on to the new system, because everything in the council has been so centralised, it's been very inefficient, uh, uh, because we need to be in a position where people who understand what's happening on the ground can make decisions and get things done. Whereas what happens now is everything has to go right up to the top. It takes ages. There's a huge amount of money wasted on, on, on projects which really aren't going to work. Um, we will have a small part to, pay in, to play in the uh, new system, and that is by looking at the local situation. We actually put down a motion to, to council about valuing the, the community sector because I think with the shortage of money it's about time that the mayor actually realised that doing things like allowing Jubilee Pool to run itself and like the community garden to actually achieve things which bluntly the council could never have achieved. We have a re remarkable list in law of organisations that do a job that the council couldn't. And I think that as well as looking at the way that things work internally within the council, we've now got a commitment to looking at how the council can change its attitude to working with the voluntary sector. And I was very glad to get support from a consortium of uh, voluntary sector organisations that, that want to work the way that we do. That's great. Thanks, Gary. Let's bring Toby in. And then I think um, Chris and then... I. Zach, and then I think I'd like to move on to the next conversation. Thanks, Tony. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it because I know we're going to come back to it. Um, the committee system won't be perfect. Um, no political system is. Uh, show me one that is and, and we'll, we'll grab it. However, as Greens, we are committed to making it work in the best way possible. 
and to collaborating cross-party. We will collaborate with other parties. We're, we're very open to that. And it's actually built into the way the Green Party works. So our internal policy, so the, the national policy and the policies we've built up for, for the wards of Bristol and for Bristol as a whole are all built from our party's membership upwards. Okay, So it's a, it's a ground up kind of uh, mentality. And that involves internal democracy and reaching consensus, because even within the Green Party, we don't all agree <laughs> on all the topics. That won't be a surprise to anyone, okay? Um, so, it, But it's really, it, it's in our blood. It's, it's the way we work, and, and we will do our best with the committee system. Thanks, Toby. Chris, do you want to come in? Yeah, a, a short answer. Uh, the, 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 before the mayor, we had a committee system uh, roughly, and the reason it didn't, if it, and I thought it was okay, but the problem was we had elections three years out of four, so nobody could do anything because you were worried about the next election. When the mayor came in, the government changed, so we now have elections all in, all out every four years, so that's a big difference. The other thing is uh, with Marvin, um, God rest him, what he is, but um, he, he didn't allow people on the cabinet like the Greens, which is ridiculous because they were the majority party on the council. Under the committees, that can't happen, of course, because the committees are divided. What's happened to it? Uh, so I'm um, equally divided between the number of councillors in each, in each party. So that, that is not going to be an issue. So I think it's going to work much better. Great. Zach, did you want to come in? Use the mic on the desk. The Greens try to get two mics. So I think we could look on the emerging committee system as either a sentence or an opportunity. I don't think we should look on it as a sentence because it's, we are where we are. And actually, I think there's a lot of possibility of what we can do. The problem with government is it can be quite knee-jerk going from one thing to the other. But actually, in this instance here, we have a committee system focused on several different like, policy areas. And we obviously, in the conversation we've just had now, there are certainly a few at the top of our agenda. We can keep it on the agenda through that way. So why not use it in that way? But also, obviously, from um, a councillor point of view, Though we, we, all, we almost have like our, our foot in two different worlds. We have a world on the street with the, you know, working with community groups and talking to people on the doorstep. But we're also in a strange world in, in Bristol City Council where we can get things done. And actually, I think that's, a bit of, that's quite, quite an advantage in that way because we can make the connection from, uh, from the streets to, to up, up there and focus on the, the issues we need. But I'll say that they'll only work, though, if we have councillors who have a, I, I, what I call an accountable and honest dialogue between community groups and that they're in their ward. And I don't think we have that right now. Thanks, Zach. Let's move on. Let's take a, another question. Quite a lot of people wrote in and said, I really want to talk about the proposed Broadwalk development and the um, development of the Red Catch Quarter. And what we tried to do is to condense all the questions we had around that into two questions. So they're quite long questions, so, so do bear with me. Um, and it's clearly an issue that has um, raised a lot of passion uh, in and around Noel. So the first question, uh, and I think if I might come to Zach and Anna to start on this, uh, is if the Broadwalk development and associated residence parking zone goes ahead, what will you do as councillors to ensure that Noel has high quality transport links and associated support services such as dentists? Can you repeat the question, sorry? Okay. And again, it's quite a long question, so it's fair to, to ask it twice. If the Broadwalk development and associated residence parking zone goes ahead, what will you do as councillors to ensure Noel has high quality transport links and associated support services, such as dentists. Okay, so trying to take this into an almost three-parter. What will I do with the Broadwalk development goes ahead, as it is? Well, I'll hope for the best, to be honest with you, because I've been campaigning quite a lot for a, a change and some sort of representation from the community in terms of the development of those plans, which I believe has been solely lacking. And that way, we would try to gear our policy towards a community-orientated approach to try and get a bit more community into what is being developed there. But nevertheless, as councillors, we had to face the fact that we may well be stuck with a development which we don't support, but we had to deal with anyway, because of that. 
When it comes to the um, residence parking zone, um, I don't believe it'll be a silver bullet for the um, the, the, uh, pro the problems regards to parking um, there. Um, and in in relation to the um, what's um, the way other parking zones developed, we will be keeping a very close eye on the affordability of the of the uh, parking zone for individual people, but also the way it works as well, because we have seen in certain parts of the city, especially in the north, that certain uh, private operators have uh, um, administered it and not particularly well. Regards to the um, individual, um, the transport links, though, uh, we are massive supporters of bus franchising, and we're quite baffled that um, Bristol Labour has been a bit, well, one side of it supports it, one side of it doesn't support it, and we just say, well, get on with it, because of controlling the local links and trying to put, restore some um, uh, parity between North and South, or coming close to having some parity North and South having links, is the way forward. Um, and that includes, as well, not only... You know, for regards to like supporting Broadhawk, but also supporting the nighttime economy in Bristol, um, and because we've had a, we had one resident who called myself because they couldn't feel they could approach their local councillor, um, and actually said that they want more the, um, um, they want longer bus hours, particularly 73, so they can collect the nighttime economy in the centre. If we're paying for a Bristol Beacon, we might as well be able to use it. Thanks, Zach. There is a counter question that we'll come to later, but um, Toby, you caught my eye then. Did you want to come in on this? Um, so I'll address the, the, the big point, which was about the transport links um, around the Broadwalk development. Um, as a green group, we will take back control of the buses in Bristol. Okay, We are absolutely committed to putting all the pressure we can to bring in the franchising system, take control of the buses into public public control, and allow us to put in place the high quality links before the first resident has moved in to the Broadwalk development, because that's the model of development that, that you see all around Europe, all around the world, where these services are not, they're not there, um, you know, two years later, three years later, they have to be there from day one. Because when those first residents moved in, that's, that's when their, their behaviours get set. If they move in and they can't get a bus somewhere, if they move in and they have to register at a dentist the other side of the city, if they move in and their nearest supermarket is a 30-minute walk away and the bus doesn't go in that direction because the bus only goes into the centre of town, then that doesn't work. So we need to, you know, we appreciate that housing needs to be built um, in at an appropriate size and scale, um, but it has to come with those, you know, that intelligent planning that allows the services to be in place and people to to have that from the first time they move in. Candy, do you want to add anything? Okay, thanks, Toby. Chris, there was a suggestion that the the Labour Party kind of were ebbing and flowing on on some of the transport issues. Uh, was that is that right? Um, not I'm aware of. Um, uh, I am um, the Broadwalk thing, yes, big issue. Um, I, I, the answer, I don't know, how do you get more dentists to come in if you have 2,000 people? How do you get more doctors to come in? How, it's, 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 it's a problem, there's no doubt about it. And it would happen if another development was going anywhere. I mean, the fact is the population of Bristol is growing. We haven't got enough houses. We need houses, and uh, we need the services to go with them. In terms of the buses... I'm sort of in a minority. I, I don't use them much because I cycle everywhere. But, I mean, I don't have a problem. There's like five buses going down the Wells Road and people are going to shout at me. But I guess if you've got to get to work at certain times, it's a problem. But if you're just using it, uh, you know, just for leisure service, I, I don't find it's much of a problem. Obviously, it could be improved. And what I would like to see is the dial ride system being extended. It's very short hours. It's nine to five. And that's a very good service. And it's vital for older people. And that should be extended. That's what I would do on that. And uh, I can live with RPZs because they have them all over London. Everyone has RPZs. It's not a big issue. Unless you've got three cars, then it's a problem. <laughs> Before we come to you, I think we've got a question from the audience here. I just wanted to add that I couldn't even get the bus here. I live near Broadwalk. I don't think there's even a bus that goes here, from no. here to Broadwalk anymore. No. Um, it's been cut, I think, years ago. Um, so, no, the 73 doesn't go down Daventry Road. It goes, um, yeah. Yeah. 
it does go through Norwest, but it doesn't go. It doesn't link the park to Broadwalk. It doesn't link the no. Norwell Media Centre to Broadwalk. Um, you say there are a lot of buses that go into town, and that's great if you want to go to town. Yeah. If you want to go anywhere else, Bedminster, Brislington, um, lots of places, you have to either get two buses or you have to do a lot of walking. I talk to a lot of elderly people on bus stops that are really struggling with getting between bus stops. But, um, yeah, I just thought I'd add that. No, I think you're right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. So when we talk about quality bus services, we're not just talking about bus services from Broadwalk down the Wells Road into the centre, aren't we? We're talking about buses that knit null together. OK, fine. Gary, yeah. does, does the development offer the opportunity to, to provide better quality bus routes across null? Yes. Uh, firstly, uh, the, the new 90 has just been launched and, and will be starting running next week. Uh, that's a very important service because it goes to South Bristol Hospital and it doesn't cover the whole of this ward, but that's a vital service. And that is one of the things that you can look at with franchising. It's essential that franchising comes in. That's a long-term solution. But whatever we decide, Bristol City Council, until the Metro Mayor gets his finger out, we're not going to get bus franchising. So we've got to realise that. Now, this new 90 service is not subsidised by the council. They're running it in the hope that enough people will use it to pay. When I spoke to them, and I'd been involved with these people before, when we launched the 51, when first took that off, and it was a great success for a couple of years and made a huge difference. But those people that are in Transpora now are actually were involved then. And they said, we want to run the service from the end of Philwood and from the uh, South Bristol Hospital to Broadwalk, but not while it's in its present state. As soon as you get the announcement that things are going ahead, you'll get the buses. But they're actually a, they're actually a killer. It, the, the fact that things have been stopped from being developed and stopped from making progress, that's the response from a commercial bus operator who wants to help. And, they, and people associated with them did help before when the 51 was launched by ourselves and made a big difference in the area. Gary, can I do a straw poll? Um, of people in the room. Um, put your hand up if you think the Broadwalk development in its current proposal, all things being equal, is the right development for that area. <coughs> Does anybody support that? <coughs> okay. Okay, that's a very clear message there, folks. Um, the other question then, which you're going to guess what it is, is put your hand up if you think it's the wrong proposal and there's a better proposal. Okay, thank you. And it's, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a scientific proposal because I know full well that there are a bunch of people who maybe aren't here tonight that support the proposal as it is. And as I said at the beginning, it's really important that we recognise and appreciate those diverse voices. They just don't happen to be here tonight. So what I'm interested in is this second question then which goes along the lines of, if the development does not proceed in its current form, how will you as councillors work with all local people and developers to ensure there's a viable alternative and that the current centre doesn't fall into disrepair and disuse? How do we do that? What would you do to engage people in that conversation to develop a new proposal? So, Gary, I'm going to come back to you, if you don't mind. But I wonder whether I could start with Chris on that. Thank you. Yes, well, tricky question. I suppose uh, try and develop a non-local plan with local people, businesses, shops, voluntary organisations, churches, uh, to see what they think could be done about it. Um, I don't like the development, it's far too big, obviously, but I do like the shops, and I don't know what's going to happen, because I use, I use Iceland, I don't have a car, I don't use the car very much. And so it's, it's, it's I will swear, it's going to be a, a very diff a difficult thing to deal with, and uh, I've got no, no bright ideas, I'm sorry. Very honest of you, Chris, thank you. Um, Cam, do you want to go next? 
So um, we, I have talked to the developers and they, well, what they are saying is that they are open to collaborating with the community more on this. Uh, they recognize they haven't done that enough up to this point and they've definitely made some mistakes, um, a lot of mistakes <laughs> in the process. Um, they, like there does there does need to be community, community involvement in de, in developing what and deciding what should be there uh, and it's what we as greens think is it, there needs to be gentle density and what that means is sort of five to six stories and you see that in a lot of European cities um, it's uh, you can get fit in quite a lot of housing there and and you can actually fit in more than you'd expect because basically you can you can fit houses in tighter and it's not in big tower blocks um, over, over, over shadowing everything. Um, so yeah, it is, it is about making sure the community's voices are heard and that they can have those discussions with developers about developing a scheme together that works for everyone and includes the services like school places and supermarkets and dentists and GPs. Um, I just do want to quickly touch on the transport issue because the member of the audience mentioned it and it is something we've been working on really hard. Um, uh, we're collaborating with a, um, a not-for-profit bus company called uh, The Big Lemon and they already run a couple of services in Bristol um, but we're we're looking we're working with them to try and develop a route that connects Knoll to Brislington and Bedminster because as as you mentioned the person in the audience um, Yes, um, no, we're looking to connect and um, I'll, I'll explain. Yeah, so at the moment, as, as a member of the audience said, um, the, all, all the buses go to the city centre. And what we need is buses that connect us to Bedminster, to Brislington, to, to South Bristol Hospital. And so, that's, so that is what we're working on with them. And we're submitting a funding application to um, bring that in, hopefully from September. Um, we'll, we'll come to Anna, Zach and, and Gary in a minute, but I just want to open this up to the audience. And, and you were, I think, suggesting you had a question? I was just going to go back to the dentist question. Hi, I'm Pete. I'm your Conservative Party rep for Noel. The dentist will stay open until the new dentist, yeah, which is where the old library is, opens. So there, won't, there will be a cohesion of service, dental services. The other major issue with Broadwalk is the NHS and Priory Road, which we all need to work on. Right, thanks very much. And you said you're a Conservative? I'm a Conservative Party rep. Right, okay, okay. Now, right. Now, you will notice, of course, that we don't have a Conservative rep on the, on the panel tonight. And my understanding is that they're not in a position to put candidates forward at this election. But we don't know because the... the no, I know you're not. The, the, um, the closing date for nominations hasn't closed yet. Okay, so we have a question at the back, Sandra. Hi, um, I'm a construction consultant and I actually specialise in the refurbishment and repair of existing buildings. It seems to me that there's not really been a lot of consideration in terms of actually just reusing what we have. Surely as a green agenda, that would be the most sustainable option. It is possible to refurbish it, it is possible to repair it, but actually probably from the developer's point of view, it's not what they want because they can't get the maximum books, we can't get the maximum return. Has there been any attempt at having those discussions with the developer? And I'm looking at the current councillor here because I don't believe that there has been. I've not really seen anything to suggest can we, can that we do, can, we just, can we just hold a response on that, Gary, if you don't mind? Uh, and let's get some more thoughts on the audience. Thanks, Gary. Evening. I am Leanne Reynolds and I led out bleed kits in Bristol due to serious youth violence. And any of you that says there's nothing going on between Hartcliffe and Knoll, there is, and we know it's postcode war. Mm -hmm. So that new youth zone that is being built, and you've now decided to call it the 2-4, two, two, and our major gang in Bristol is called the 2-4s. So I'm going to object straight away to that, because there's postcode wars all across our city, and there is no way you should call a youth zone after numbers which is coded. And I am going to act, I am going to take it further as I can. Now I want everyone up there to realise that we need bleed kits. 
these bleed kits are coming out and I'm putting them out across the city and they're being funded by the community because they are what comes in police cars, they are what comes on an ambulance and it is the best piece of equipment that can save an individual's life if they have has a catastrophic bleed. And one has been used in Noel, which saved a young man's leg and possibly his life. So it's not generally just for knife crime, but more needs to be done on knife crime. Mm -hmm. And we need, whoever gets in, you need to get to Parliament and ban the knives because mm -hmm. they should have been banned from last year. No one needs to walk with a knife and we need to look at sentencing and how we're going to actually deal with these people that are caught with a knife. And also we need bleed kit training in the curriculum. They need to learn how to use it. Every child from the age of eight needs to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say thank you for bringing us back to that really important issue? And it's an issue that isn't going to go away and will come up in many, many conversations, I'm sure. So, so thanks for that additional clarity. Are there any more points around uh, the Broadwater development before we bring Gary and, uh, Anna and Zach in? OK. So the question is... If the proposal doesn't go ahead in its current format, what would you do to work with the community and developers uh, to, to build a, a collaborative and more viable alternative? So, um, firstly, Leanne, I would really like to meet with you after, if you're around after this event. I've already been in contact with Carly, but I've been meaning to reach out to you and have a chat, but I think that would be better one-to-one. -one. So if you're around, that would be really good. If not, I will get in touch. Um, in terms of... Yeah, of course you can. I think that's a really good question. And yeah, it's something I plan to do, actually. You've, you've brought that to the forefront of my mind. Hands up, it's not something that I'd thought about doing um, in the last sort of few weeks, obviously, it's, it's a little bit busy at the moment, but that is something, yeah, that I think would be a really good thing to do, and that's something that Zach and I will do straight away. Thank yeah, you. Th thanks for raising that, and, and maybe it's something that the, yeah. all, all the uh, prospective yeah. candidates can uh, consider. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so, Broadwalk. So, Broadwalk. So, first of all, I don't think it's likely that nothing will happen there. I don't think it's a case of this or nothing else. And I think that's something that's been sold, unfortunately, to people. And we've been constant, that's been constantly repeated. And it's just not true. If we look at other developments around the city, um, we, you know, there's constant debate between developers and local communities. They will come back with new plans. They'll present that to the community. You can comment on it. They go away. They adjust things and they come back. And I think that that's just what we really need to be pushing for here. It's not a case of nobody's going to do anything with it and it will just fall into disrepair if we don't get a 12-story massive, like massively over dense building. Um, in terms of what we would do, uh, Zach and I have obviously campaigned on this for well over a year now. So we've done extensive surveying of residents as well. And the consensus is always that there must be something, but not at this density. Um, I'm really keen to hear more about the sustainable construction idea, actually, and refurbishment. That isn't something that I have read about in terms of the proposals for Broadwalk, but that would be something that I'd be really keen to explore um, and whether there's any possibility for that on that site. Um, but yeah, in terms of working, we've always strength, we've always sort of said that we would work with developers and with the community as a bridge between the two. That's our role as councillors, is to represent your views to the developers and to work with them to get something that is wanted by the community and needed. And, but I don't think that it's not going to go ahead if we don't accept it at this stage, at this level. So we're heading up to a break, but before we go to our break. Let's come to Gary. Is, is there another alternative, Gary? Is there another way of working with the community? Well, quite early in this process, we asked people who were opposed to the present development for alternatives, and none came forward. And basically, no, not, none came forward that were in, in any way viable or could, in actual fact, proceed. It's very easy to criticise the developers, and they, they haven't got their publicity right at all. That's absolutely the case. 
But we are in a position now where we have a non-functioning shopping centre. It went bust seven years ago under previous management. Uh, so basically it was a mess then. It's been a mess for quite some considerable period of time. Pe people, if you look at the quality of life survey across Bristol, uh, uh, generally in null, it performs better on all sorts of issues, but it's got a record low in terms of the satisfaction with the shopping centre. Yes, they looked at refurbishment. In fact, the first plan that came forward involved a little bit of refurbishment, but it didn't work financially. If you speak to the people who worked in the shops, they will tell you stuff is coming through the ceiling. It's in a desperate mess, and it would cost a fortune to patch it up. And why would they patch it up when it's got non-viable units? That's why the shops have actually left. It's why they've gone and we're left with nowhere for people to shop. Now that is a desperate situation. It's fine if you get your deliveries you know, from, from the supermarket on, on, on a van. It's fine if you've got a car to drive away to a supermarket. But what people need in this area is actually a decent shopping centre with the facilities. And if you speak to people on the doorstep, they might not like every detail, of what's in the proposal. And the crucial thing is, as has been said, the developers are ready to negotiate. Now they've got, although it's been challenged in the courts, they've got outline plan of emission. Now that is a big circle. And it says up to so and so, up to this, up to that. That isn't exactly what will be built. And they've got to come back now for detailed planning permission. And quite a lot will actually change as an example when they put in the estimates and numbers of flats and whatever, uh, one of the key partners is going to be uh, the St Monica's Trust, Homes for Older People. Now, those were put in in the outline plans as being government standard size. They won't be that government standard size because apart from anything else, St Monica's don't want them that size. They want the rooms larger. So that means if even the, the same space is actually taken up, there will be less flats. And most, uh, as I say, that's a big part of the initial development in Monica's. And if you ask around this area, you'll find huge numbers of people who want somewhere nice to retire. Gary, I've got to just so pause basically, you there, mate. what I would say is that we have two choices. We can either negotiate or we can block it in the courts. And I can tell you that the people out there actually want negotiation to refine it to get the best to get the best solution. And what I would challenge the people who try to stop this through the courts is if the, if the people actually support us in the election on the 2nd of June, I would expect them to agree that the people have spoken. And that's what we're actually after. Just to, just, thanks Gary. A slip of the tongue, May, not June. Sorry? Elections in May, not June. Slip of the, slip of the tongue, slip of the tongue. So, um, we, we all get tongue-tied, it's fine. Uh, before we take a short break, I think it's important we stretch our legs. A couple of points from the audience. Um, thank you. Hello. Oh, there we go. I just wanted to circle back to that first point you made about um, going out to the community to ask them for an alternative. Um, why is it as a, on us as a community to be architects and to be financial experts and to be experts in planning and you know all of those skills that people are paid very well to do? Our job, actually your job, is to listen to the community, to take on our feedback and, and for the developers and the architects and the councillors to listen to us. We are clearly, from the turnout tonight, a very engaged community who are willing to provide that opinion and who have done so for years. But the idea that we should be coming up with financially viable alternatives, we are not paid to do that. That is your job. That is your job to work with the people. So please don't put that on us. Thank you very much. Uh, I saw a, another couple of hands. Thank you. Um, from my point of view, this is the first meeting I've ever been to like this because I'm here to decide who gets my vote to who I trust. Mm -hmm. That end of the room, the thing is, I've lost trust because the first development, 400 flats, I'm happy with that. That seemed like a great alternative, that got my tick. Then all of a sudden, 
it's 800. Wow, how did that change? Then it's voted against, then that changed. Yeah. And I'm like, how, why, how did that happen? And I think, uh, like me, a lot of people are in this room because they've lost their trust. <coughs> I'm ashamed to say that in local elections, I haven't voted every time, but I will from now on, because I've got to, I've got to look on Facebook to be clued up about what's happening at the top of my road. Literally, I've, I've lived there 30 years. Do I, want, do I want that monstrosity up there overlooking the park? Of course I don't. Do I want an alternative and come together? And then there's, I cannot believe that it's 800 flats or nothing. I just, I can't, uh, and I, you know, I need to, my vote is very important, obviously, I've realised that, and it's who I'm going to trust. Brilliant, thank you. The, the conversation about trust, well, it's very important, we're going to pick that up later, about how we work with our communities to build trust and develop more political <laughs> discourse. Uh, one more question from the audience, then Cam, then a, a leg stretch, okay? Um, yeah, I think, guess, it seems like a sort of, false forced choice it's felt brought up a few times um <laughs> and i can understand that if the legal thing is you know it's up to this many flats it's up to this many stories it's you know we've heard it <laughs> i feel like time and time again you know there's going to be social housing in this it's up to has to be at least one percent but these are money making corporate businesses that want to squeeze all the money they can out of this so as i feel like you know, as soon as that upper limit is there, as soon as, you know, we saw it with university fees, like, this is how much it could be. That's what every single university charge. Like, I think it's naive, perhaps, to be like, there's still bargaining and space within that. Maybe there is a bit, but who has the power in that once it's gone through? That's not with us at that point. Thank you, thank you. Um, and Toby, I'm sorry, I meant Toby, not Cam. Thank you, because you almost made my point for me, um, which is that I, I don't trust the developers as far as I could throw them. Um, uh, as you say, developers will get away with the maximum that, that you let them get away with because they are profit-making entities. That's what, that's what they do. And Bristol's planning system is in disarray. Okay, the, the planning department is in an absolute mess. We've seen recently that it's been put into special measures by the government, not that I trust the current government um, any further either. Um, but I don't buy the, the, the arguments about viability and the promises of community involvement from, um, from an organization which hasn't done it in the past. Well, that, that's an empty promise um, for me. And the viability argument has been our own making, and by, by us I mean uh, the, the city council, because the, this weak planning department driven by um, politicians with large egos and tower blocks equate with large egos, um, this, this, they have allowed developers to get away with more and more and more, which then means that developers are paying more for the sites like Broadwalk because they know they can get away with something big. So the viability financial viability is driven you know by choices we make they come back around to haunt us okay so we we really need to see a reform of the the, the planning system the planning department they've said they're bringing in more people you know to process the applications but the real focus at the moment is on getting through applications faster that that's not the priority for me o okay if you if you want to build a single story extension on the back of your house and things like that we should prioritize those and let you do that but the focus for these big developments should be on quality and holding the developments to account and building developments which add value for the people that already live here and the people that move in because they deserve to live somewhere high quality as well so that, that it's a systemic issue but we need to reform it from the Thanks, ground up. Thanks Toby. I'm going to test the mood of the room. Would people like a short break? Stretch your legs? Yeah? Five minutes? Meet you back here in five minutes. And the question, to give you a heads up, is going to be, what do you think defines a good councillor? Give you time to think about that one. Now, quite often in the second half, people take the opportunity to go home. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that, that hasn't really happened. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, panellists, you're, you're, you're really holding our attention, so thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> okay. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, folks. It's going okay? I think we spent the right amount of time on both those two incredibly important and significant issues. Knife crime, what we're going to do about it collectively, and Broadwalk, how we might consider new ways of working together for collective benefit. And I think the two things link together quite nicely. And James at the back there made a very interesting comment about what are the opportunities to develop some kind of uh, community facility within the Broadwalk development that supports the needs of the issues around knife crime and other such uh, topics. So I really like that. That idea of knitting things together, it's great to get those ideas from people. So um, you've had a bit of time to think about this one, panellists. <coughs> What do you think defines a good counsellor? And in 90 seconds. <laughs> so, because I think one of the things for me that defines a good counsellor is the ability to be succinct. <laughs> <laughs> to start. Who'd like to start? Chris, go ahead. Um, well, I enjoyed being, I was a councilwoman for 11 years and I enjoyed being there. I liked helping people. My social service job was complaints manager, so it was useful. And only how to deal with complaints about the council. And, um, and I thought I did lots of good in, in Wimble Hill, um, you know, getting kids to do murals. When we started gardening them into the station, we got the kids involved so they wouldn't distract it and taught them how to do um, graffiti stuff. And basically, it's just making the community a better place by doing stuff. And... Uh, that's it. And if you enjoy it, and I enjoy it, I want to go on helping people and um, sorting out problems. That's it. Thanks. 40 seconds. Oh. Gary, Chris did in 40 seconds. There's your challenge. He's done more than me, though. <laughs> he says. What are the qualities of a good councillor, Gary? Well, I think the acid test is, do they get re-elected? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that is absolutely vital, because basically you stand there you, it's easy to make promises, it's easy to make false promises, but people judge you on what actually you've done over the years. And that, I'm glad to say, has meant that I've been re-elected for 22 years. Now, we don't, you can't please everybody all the time, but if you tell people the way that it actually is, even if they don't particularly like it at the time, that you get the, the position of getting back in and getting re-elected. And I'll repeat what I said earlier, you will find that in this election we'll either be re-elected or we'll have a position where somebody who's opposed to the development of Broadwalk will be uh, elected. And that is an acid test. And if we, we are re-elected, then we take that as a mandate to negotiate to improve what's going to be delivered there rather than killing it. Brilliant. Thanks, Gary. I, I'm reflecting on the notion that Gary and Chris have been a feature of my life as an old resident for 22 years. I'm not quite sure how I feel about that in terms of how old I am now, but, uh, but thank you. Um, <laughs> Big pardon, Chris? <laughs> Toby, would you like to go next? Thank you. Um, so, so Gary mentioned telling people things, but isn't it more about listening to people? Um, <laughs> So I've knocked on a lot of your doors. I recognise a lot of your faces. You've had the, the pleasure uh, of meeting me, um, but you'll, you'll probably notice that I don't actually tell you anything apart from who I am. And then I ask for your views and your thoughts about what's important for your community. Now, don't get me wrong. We have things we want to do. We have decisions we have to make. We have things we want to achieve. And we won't be afraid to push back when, you know, because... We can't achieve consensus across every single person in Old Ward. But if we can do that in an open and transparent way and you can actually see the evidence we've used to make our decisions, I think that will gain your trust in, in us as councillors. So it's about hearing from you first and then openness and transparency. Thanks, Toby. So, Cam, what are the qualities of a good councillor? 
well, I think Toby mentioned most of them. Um, I think it is it's about giving people power, like making sure you're involved in decision making. It's not it's not just about what we think. It is, as Toby says, about listening. Um, and yeah, he pretty much said it, said it all. So <laughs> come back to me. <laughs> That's perfectly okay, Cam. It's good. So. We've got longevity, we've got listening, we've got doing things. In a funny sort of way, I guess you're probably going to say those things, <laughs> but what else might there be that defines a good counsellor? Well, to myself, I think accountability is one sort of thing that needs to be um, present in the, count the uh, counsellor. And for myself, um, I'm actually an autistic person. I discovered I was autistic about a year ago. So I'm constantly reevaluating myself and how I appear to the world, and how I how I talk to people. And I'm constantly trying to challenge myself in how it goes as well. And I think sometimes counsellors don't have that, that kind of accountability for themselves. They just feel like it's their, uh, their propensity to lead, but not to listen at the same time. Being a good counsellor is about knowing when to listen, and when to talk, and when to, uh, when to, uh, when to lead, and when to realise where the community leaders are, and support them. It's also about embedding yourself in a community, which we have done over the past year and a half, working with local community groups of volunteering for groups like the Jubilee Pool and Friends of Red Catch Park and that. We have been on the front lines helping people there and in some, and some meetings there as well, offering suggestions wherever. We've been present, and that's what councils need to do. It's not just to be a bit like a sort of a, a council version of Santa Claus giving presents. They need to be up with the count, having the conversation with those communities down there, and that's what we've been doing. We need to be delivering as well. Quite soon, there'll be, um, there'll be another um, leaflet which shows them what we've delivered so far, and the road improvements and, and the issues that we have highlighted, because we are showing that we are delivering as well as talking as well, and we apologise for the amount of leaflets, but the problem is the next ones will be informative. <laughs> exactly. Your time's up. I hope they're on recycled paper. <laughs> they, they are. Anna? They are. So the difficulty in coming last is that a majority of my points have been made. Um, I suppose about myself, public duty is always something that's been really close to me. I've worked in healthcare for a number of years. I've always been um, in sort of in different sort of voluntary roles as well. And yeah, I, I like to serve people, and I'm quite humble in that way. I suppose I really value going out and meeting people and doing things for them. Um, I think the what epitomizes really a, a good counsellor and what embodies a good counsellor is somebody that is. Um, willing to help, um, that is diligent as well, that can scrutinise um, across the board. So anything from scrutinising uh, proposed development to scrutinising themselves. As Zach said, um, I am also the type of person to scrutinise what I'm doing and think about my actions um, and think about how I speak with people. I think, again, the ability to listen is probably the most key thing for me that's something that I've developed um, over the years in, in healthcare. Listening to people is really key and doing things with them and not to them. Um, and that, that's the key thing for a counsellor to be. Um, and just lastly, the little things, actually. So um, over the last sort of 18 months, we've been picking up quite a lot of casework that's been brought to our attention by residents, things that maybe haven't been resolved. Tiny things, so potholes, we all hate them. They might seem quite minor, um, but they are a nightmare. That's something that we've been picking up and doing in our own time. Thanks, so we are not elected councillors, but Time's we've up. been doing that. Time's up. Thank is you. It, really? it is. Yeah. <laughs> 90 seconds goes very quickly. So you know what I'm going to do, don't you? Because we've heard what the councillors, prospective councillors think the qualities of a good councillor are. But what we really want to hear is what you think the qualities of a good councillor are. And no roaming mics. I just wanted to shout out the qualities that you look for in a local councillor. So a bit of a free-for-all. Twice as much as you talk. I like that. Anybody else? Empathy. Lovely. Lovely empathy. Hard work. Hard work. People helping you to get engaged and involved in the community. Brilliant. Thanks, Brian. Down the back here. Okay. 
campaign for improved health services, including an accident and emergency department in South Bristol. Yeah? A lack of ego. Okay, anything else? Collaborative style. Tell me more about that. What does that mean to you? Brilliant. And we've heard that a few times this evening, haven't we, about the, the power of the collective and how we might move things forward. Can I add one? Yes, of course. So impact through public speaking. Okay. Oh, professionalism. Okay. Respectful of opinions. Now, remember at the very beginning, I talked about the idea of politics is the thing that makes everybody sort of get up because we've all got different positions and interests around common issues. About employment, about keeping people secure, safe, yeah. addressing poverty. Gosh, there's a lot. Honesty, honesty and integrity. And you were going to say, you can say it again. Say honesty. honesty and integrity. And again, honesty and integrity. So this is about listening to people and influencing change. Yep. I love that. So this is, I, I love that idea of that annual appraisal. I get one in my, in my job in the health service. Brilliant, thank you. And, and I think just on that point, great respect to you guys for coming out tonight and being part of this conversation. It really does mean a lot to the people in this room. Opportunities to meet and talk about the issues of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So there could be... So it's about the surgeries, it's about... There could be personal issues to discuss, there could be collective issues. Thank you, thank you. Anything else? Any... Things on this? Brilliant. One. There's a question. Does it matter? Is it important that our local councillors live in Knoll? Yes or no? Yes? No, I know. About you, you sparked a, a memory about a question that we'd received in the, in the inbox. So, there was a little bit of a, a rumble about yes on that one. Is it? Pardon me? Hand survey. Is it important that your local councillor lives in Noel? Okay. It's a, it's a, if it's important, put your hand up. Okay. I would say 50-50-ish. Ish. Any other thoughts? Valerie, you've got your hand up there? No, you're just stretching your fingers. That's fine. No, thank you. Okay. So we're split, aren't we? For some people, it's important. For other people, it's the quality of the council and not necessarily where they live. And that's understandable. Brilliant. So thank you very much indeed for that. And I think there's some really useful insights and feedback uh, that you may want to reflect on in terms of how you are as councillors and, and, and just the way you engage with your uh, electorate, I guess. Um, so hope, hopefully that's been useful. Um.
marches on. I want to raise a question about representation. And a number of people wrote into the inbox and wanted to uh, ask a question about reinvigorating local politics. How do we have these conversations? And the question is, if elected, what will you do to reinvigorate local politics and ensure that young people and our diverse community in Knoll have a voice? You've got to remember my name. It's important. You need to put the cross next to it on the ballot paper. Um, <laughs> Take that hit. <laughs> so, believe it or not, I think Noel is actually a fantastic example of a politically engaged community. You have a number of fantastic community groups, some of which have grown out of adversity. So it's a shame that the, the issues have had to happen to cause those groups to form together. But you know, you've, you've got the Broadwalk group, you've got the Red Catch Park uh, Friends group, you've got the Community Garden, you've got the Jubilee Pool group, you've got uh, Mike and his amazing football team and all the other community groups that I've forgotten that aren't on the top of my head right now. And actually, you're one of the only communities in Bristol that is having an election debate for local council candidates. And look how many people are here. So I don't think it's about stimulating it from, from nothing. I think it's about growing this, this group of people here and the people who are watching online and the, the people who come to these meetings and, and expanding that further into the, into the more diverse parts of the community. So younger people, I think actually we can get them involved in politics in a, in a loose way. Nobody, they don't want um, us to go in there and, and start lecturing at them, but if they can get involved in some of the existing community groups which maybe don't have representation from younger communities at the moment, I think that's a great start. It may not seem like politics at the time, but actually all of these things are intrinsically linked with politics. So for me, that's, that's the best entry point. Um, you know, we, you'll find that a lot of young people have very strongly held views um, on, on the environment, on sustainability, on uh, fairness, social justice, and diversity and inclusion, but they don't necessarily link those views with things that happen at a local level. They're more thinking at national, international level. So I think that's something we can, we can sort of educate them on what they can do locally to bring their views into action. Thanks, Thanks Toby. Uh, Gary, you're next, and then Chris. I think that um, people have got different, different definitions of what politics is. Probably one of the most important things that we've actually did was campaign repeatedly to keep Jubilee Pool open. And then the most important bit was working with the Friends Group to actually take it over. They were a bit sceptical at first as to whether they could do it but they've done a brilliant job. Now that sort of thing, empowering organisations at a local level to do things is the most important thing that we can actually do. I mean, today I had knocked on 100 doors and I got the feedback from those people on various things that are going on. And basically from that, it's very clear what the position of the community is. I mean, there's 100 doors today. We've knocked on about 1,000 over the last uh, a few months or so a lot of these people are emailing us daily and letting us know about things so we've made us we've made ourselves open to actually get feedback from people we communicate we don't please everybody all the time it can't be done but empowering organizations like the jubilee pool to take over that is more important than how much I could say in a committee meeting in the council house. Hopefully that will improve now because we've had a non-listening mayor who's gone down a path and councillors from all parties have found it very difficult to make any progress in getting things listened to. But I suspect that things will now improve. But you can't replace working with members of the community like with Jubilee, like with the community garden. And, and others that make all the difference. That's what politics is about. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Nice one. Chris? Um, well, when I was a councillor, I did talk to local schools about politics, which is very interesting. And uh, the question about surges, we used to hold 
not so much surgeries, but uh, leafleted street, and they put this leaflet in the window if you want to talk to us. So the idea is to actually meet as many people as possible, like Gary says, to find out what they want and do something about it. And uh, groups, I, mean, I co-founded Victoria Park Action Group, which has been very influential in sorting out Women Hill and doing stuff in Women Hill. So it's basically listening to people, as someone said, listening and uh, trying to find what they want and trying to meet their needs. The only thing I started was a kingfisher group in um, cleaning up the Malago as it goes through St John's industrial estate, getting out trolleys, which is quite fun, and that's been clear ever since. So at uh, just working with people and um, uh, giving people the idea that groups have power, which they do have power, as individuals don't have power. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. <coughs> Cam, do you want to add anything at this stage? Um, I think Gary said you can't please everyone, and that is true, but I think something that's been missing is when you disagree with people, you still treat them with respect. Um, and, yeah, I think that's the only thing I want to add at the moment, but, yeah. Thanks, Cam. And if I can come to, to Zach and Anna. Um, so, it's a difficult thing, isn't it? Um, I think one thing that's become really apparent to me being on the doorstep with many of you over the last few months is that, and, and I think this I, we would pick this up across the board as well, people's it, faith in politicians is at an all-time low and people are really quite depressed over the whole situation and that's at a local and a national level. And I think how we change that is, actually, is, is really quite complex and probably too long for me to go on into tonight. And speaking about going on, I think sometimes as politicians and aspiring politicians, we get caught up in, in thinking about what we're doing and we act as if everybody is really interested in how politics works and what's going on. And, you know, that everyone has the same level of sort of interest in that that we do. And that, that isn't the case, but that doesn't mean that people don't deserve representation um, in, in, you know, a council level and a national level that represents their best interests. So... Of course, it's about engaging people in their local communities and involving them in, in politics, absolutely. And that goes for much younger people as well. I think that that starts at a very young age, personally. Um, but it's also about just getting the job done, doing the job and doing it well in the background um, and making things as efficient and, and sustainable as possible within a community. I think that that's just what it kind of is, is about for me but again I do yeah I will happily talk politics with anyone for hours on end and probably chew their ear off um and yeah I think people that are willing to do that we do need to engage people more and part of that is by actually just demonstrating what a good councillor can do and thanks everyone does anybody from the audience mm. want to come in yes uh, uh, hang on a second we'll get the the roving mic to you uh right at the back Sean to start with Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> the wrong way. Hi, thank you very much for your um, feedback on the question. Just to say, just looking at the top table might be part of the problem. So we've got, I'm going to call it out, we've got one female. Um, however, society is generally 51% female and 49% male. And our political system is consistently turning out males. It's not that we don't like males. It's just we'd like re representation, and representation includes gender representation. Uh, and so it's for you, my dear, on the end, to make that case, and not for me to come here and make that case on your behalf. Uh, second thing I'd like to say is, in terms of representing people of different ethnic groups, for example, um, clearly I'm standing out here, and there are other people who look like me in the community and who want to be valued members in the community. How can I be expected to come to the old school and expect you to advocate for me when clearly there are other people in society who, if you could step back and um, join them and mentor them, they could go forward and we would have a better political system that represents the community that it's in. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? 
point well made. Representation is hugely important, and it's come up in a number of the conversations this evening. Hmm. Hang on. Candidate in the election, and there is also a, no, a non-white candidate. Mm. Yeah. So that's right. So Gis Gislaine, Gislaine is on holiday, and Shahab was not able to come tonight for other family reasons. So, so thank you for pointing that out. It is Ramadan as well. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I promise you'd end at nine. There's always more questions that we can ever get through. And we've got a long list of questions on the question inbox. And some of you will have uh, written a question down on the I've got a question piece of paper. Do make sure that you leave those uh, with the organisers tonight. And they're going to be collated, is that right? And then shared. So we're not going to get through everything tonight. What I would like to do is to move forward four years and I want you to imagine that it's the 3rd of April 2028 and we've all got back together again. It's lovely to see you. You don't look a day older. And what I'd like to do is I'd just like to ask our panellists, looking back over the past four years, what difference have you made and what would you like to be remembered for by your electorate. Chris, would you like to start? Uh, I would dearly love to do something about the HGVs charging down the Wells Road, um, which they aren't going to Bristol, they're just going through Bristol, going to the M32, and that we've counted them. It's like a 15 an hour going straight through and going up the M32. I'd like to know about that. By uh, creating a sort of park and ride for lorries up with church where the viaduct is, where there's a wasteland underneath it. I would like to uh, see the end of scooters riding on pavements very quietly and knocking people off and dangerous. Um, I'd like to... Uh, oh, what was that? Oh, just, just um, generally... Uh, having more cycleways, off-road cycleways to encourage people to get out of their cars um, because people think electric cars are the solution. They're not the solution at all. They're just going to be traffic jams and just as noisy as petrol cars because the noise you hear when I lie awake at night on the Bath Road is um, the wheels, it's not the engine. So I'd like, there's a lot of noise pollution. I'd like to see the end of noise pollution and the more peaceful lull. That's what I'd like to see. Thanks, Chris. Some very practical things there. Gary, can I come to you? So it's 3rd of April 2028. What are you remembered for? Uh, well, can I firstly say thank you to the organisers for finding our colour. We were rebranded in the adverts. I'd actually, to make clear to everybody here tonight, although it was advertised that we had declined to take part, not one word came from me at all saying we would not take part. So I don't know how they managed to make that mess up, but I, I did folks. not say I would not be there. Okay, let's let's, um, let's right. focus on the yeah. on so the the question about what you're right. remembered for, Gary. I, I have a small advantage over the others in that we have done a few things. We have actually managed to, you know, get Jubilee Pool into local hands. We have managed to get uh, the, uh, the the satisfaction levels for most people on most things on no, on environment, etc., significantly above the Bristol average. What I'll be looking forward uh, and to, to look back in four years' time, the biggest thing of the lot is to ensure that we do not have a derelict shopping centre causing damage to the whole community. We've managed, we've managed to make progress on so many things, but that would actually be extremely damaging to no. And I want to make certain we avoid that. Very, it's a very clear ambition from, from Gary there. Um, Toby, do you want to go next? So, four years hence, what are you remembered for by the people of Noel? Um, well, I'll tell you the, the, the thing I don't want to be remembered for, which is a, I don't want to be remembered for a big ego-driven project. That's, mm. that's, that's not what, what makes me want to do this. But how, how do I want to be thought of? I, I want to be integrated in a community, integrated into all, all the great organisations who have um, 
that launched this event today, in a community who feel that they're empowered in local decision making, that their voices are being heard, and that the local decisions are being devolved down to them as a community, wherever it's you know appropriate and possible through things like it, giving more empowerment to the area committees about investment in the local area, rather than deciding that centrally somewhere in City Hall. Um, I'd like you to remember me as the one who brought you along the journey. Um, even if you didn't agree with me on something at the start, then maybe you'd agree with me by the end. Maybe not, you know, we can't agree on everything, but I think for the things we don't agree on, it's my job to convince you, and it's my job to show you the evidence and to, to bring you on that journey with, with me, or to change my own path based on a strong um, community feeling. Um, yeah, that, that's it, really. Uh. Thanks very much, Toby. So um, I work in education, so something that I quite want to see is the Daffing Two Road School finally open um, and hopefully performing to a high level with um, providing a, a good, uh, a strong education for the people of now. Um, yeah, yeah, just that. Um, and yeah, that's just reiterating some of the points that Toby made. It is making sure that I I have um, allowed people's voices to be heard, that they feel like if the changes they want to see in the community can actually happen. And yeah, just working collaboratively with, with the people of now. Thanks, Cam. <laughs> Well, I would like us to be remembered because hopefully we'll both be elected. <laughs> Maybe getting ahead of the name. Um, as a as a partnership that well, first of all, tries brings the political discourse in null to a sensible and adult level, mm -hmm. a level where you can actually you know, have news about what's happening in regards to your community without personal insults against opponents in there. But thanks to the free advertising, yeah. and when the but also a, a place where you feel that um, the community groups are being treated and enabled to do what they can do without without prejudice and without fear of uh, of um, being singled out or being um, being left out. I want to leave a a, um, a null where people believe in a system again, and especially planning. Well, hope hope can <laughs> things can happen in that way. I want people to be to be able to feel like they look around their, uh, their ward, feel like it's improving. Feel like they can walk across the street at that and, and on pl places which feel like they're being taken care of, and well designed and well accounted for. And I want to, um, first of all, I want to uh, wake up at a um, place for um, four years' time, where you'd be uh, happy to go on the journey with myself again. Um, <laughs> um, but also know that if we disagree, and we may well disagree on certain issues, I'm not going to be completely here. But you at least give me the credit that I, I try to do the best of my position. And I would try to at least try and beat you halfway on the things we could possibly disagree agreeably on. Thanks, Zach. Anna, I'm a little concerned. I've, I've come to you last on a couple of occasions. That's it's not okay. intentional, <laughs> I assure you. That's all right. It gives my brain a stretch. It's fine. Um, so on a practical level, I suppose what I would like to see is sustainable public transport, not only up and down the Wells Road, but around South Bristol. Um, and a proportionate and thriving Broadwalk, which I believe fully is achievable. Um, I, but mostly I want people who have be, feel that they've been able to bring their concerns to me and their problems to feel listened to and supported, and that the responses and the experience that they have, have of, me, of me are transparent and accountable and empowering. Um, you know, I am a disabled woman in politics, and I, one thing I would really like to do is be remembered for empowering people that face the challenges that I do to join in in their local communities and to be part of it in the way that I've been privileged to be in Knoll so far. Um, and that's, that's probably the most important for me. It's remembering, it's being remembered for who I am and how I've supported people and engaged with people rather than even the practicalities on the ground, although they're important for me. It's about who I am as an individual and how I am remembered and seen. Thanks, Anna. So before I bring you back to the modern day, can I open the question to everybody in the audience? It's the 3rd of April 2028. What's changed? What do you want to see happening? 
I'm wondering whether the uh, tactical voting that is referred to in the uh, feedback uh, form that we have here, and uh, it's very rare that I would agree with much that Councillor Hopkins would say, but he did pose the point earlier that his party are the only parties who are looking to um, support the development of Broadwalk as, as the Outline Planning Commission stands, and it's uh, whether uh, there would be any regrets uh, on in, in 2028 as to how, how the voting has gone in 2024. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Aspirations for 2028? Hang on a second. More knives. And bleed kit training in schools. I'm going down to the front here. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, just to say that um, our councillors can't do everything for us, and we have some responsibilities too. And one of my things I'd love to see in four years is that there are less cars in Knoll and more people using buses and <coughs> bikes, which will make it easier to make a successful transport service. And also that people are walking down to our shopping centre and not getting in their cars and driving to give the money to somewhere else in Bristol. Oh, peop shop, yeah, we have responsibilities too. Shop local and get out of our cars. So it's about understanding your role as a resident of Knoll and the impact you can have in your actions. Brilliant. Yes, hang on. Um, ooh, ooh. You're getting a, a, double, a double hit. Do you want to go first, Sean? Um, I'd like to see reinstatement of the neighbourhood partnerships that used to exist across the city or a version of that because it's really important that that wards come together and look across their boundaries and aren't just isolated in what they want to get out of things. Thank you. Um, I'd like to be able to have a conversation with my councillor shortly before we go into a meeting with the Broadwalk developers, if it's still sort of up for debate, and have a united front going in, deciding what we want to represent the community. I think I'd just like to see transparency mm -hmm. and fact and it to be truthful. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been told that the CAS system, clean air, brilliant, it's made a lot of money. Why isn't that being spent on buses mm -hmm. and local transport? I take my car in town because it's easy. If, if I've got two people with me, not now that the buses are a lot cheaper, but before that, it was more economical for two of us to park up in the galleries and go into town than it was to get a return on the bus, if the bus turned up, Thank if you. it wasn't full. So, yeah, transparency. Can we take one final point? For that? Thank you. And very quickly, um, in four years' time, I'd like to look back at this time and see that if councillors are being taken through a disciplinary process, that that process is concluded, there is an outcome, and there is a way forward. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to bring you back to the current day, so you don't, don't, you don't think you're in the future. It's the 3rd of April 2024. And I, I almost forgot, didn't I? And, uh, <laughs> it's been a, been a long night. It's been a long night. Um, voting is on May the 2nd. Don't forget your photo ID. Okay, let's say it again. Don't forget your photo ID. If you don't know what photo ID you need, have a Google, and there's a good long list of what you can take uh, and what, what's applicable. Um, can I just say thank you? Uh, thank you to the organisers uh, for this event. I was delighted when Leslie <laughs> called me and said, would you be interested in facilitating this event and bringing an impartiality to it. And I hope I've done that. I've really tried hard to do that. I hope I've represented your questions well. 
there are so many questions. I think it's all been quite a challenge to sort of bring them in. And I know that we haven't covered everything. But I think what we can see is a real uh, interest and a commitment to want to have conversations like this. Um, thank you to the volunteers for helping out with the mics. And, and you know, finally, <laughs> I just want to say thanks to Anna, to Zach, to Cam, to Toby, to Chris, and to Councillor Gary Hopkins for choosing to spend the Wednesday evening with us and meeting you and being prepared to be open and honest with your questions. I wish you all the very best of luck uh, and thank you and safe journey home, everybody. Thank you very much.